All right. Hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM joining you from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to welcome back Matt McDarby, who is across in Maryland on the other on the other side of the country. How are you doing, Matt? That's right. I'm uh, chillier, chillier than you are, John. <laughs> well, it, probably much chillier because we actually are having a two or three day heat wave right now. So uh-huh. <laughs> just terrible. to make you feel just make you feel worse. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Um, and uh, and and Matt is a long time um, sales professional, sales consultant, and he's the founder and CEO of United Sales Resources USR and the author of how many books now? Three, four, three. Yeah, three, three. And we're going to talk about the latest one here, which is called The Divine Comedy of Sales. Um, so the only Divine Comedies I know is the original Divine Comedy. There was also a band out of Cork once upon a time called The, the Divine Comedy. And now there's a sales book called The Divine Comedy of Sales. So, um, hey, Matt, let's get straight into what, what's the genesis of this? Where did this idea come from? Um, well, this so like you said, this is my third book. The first two books were about uh, some common challenges that people in sales leadership find themselves facing. One is, you know, the first one was about time, and I can't, I can't make enough time to do important things well. That was the first one. Second book was about talent. How can I approach getting the right talent in, in-house to get done what we need to get done? Because that's hard. And how do, I, how do I do that more systematically? And then the third one, as, as I think about, because you know, I'm a you know, sales leader myself, and I've done mm-hmm. interim sales leadership roles and full-time roles, and I coach and develop uh, sales leaders, right, in middle market and large enterprises. And I'm very conscious of the challenges that people in those roles have. So um, the idea of building real kind of followership, I don't I think that's, if it's not a word, it is now, because I've been saying <laughs> it now for several months, um, but getting the best out of the people on your team, right? If you're if you've got a proper operating rhythm with them and you're focused on the right things and, and you've got the right people on the team, you need to start paying attention to how you go about leading. So the more I thought about that, I was like, who the, like of the best leaders I've worked with, what was the environment like and why, what was different about their approach and how did they get the best out of me? And the more I mm-hmm. thought about it, it was like, it kind of came down to two things. How did they carry themselves and then how do they treat others? How do they treat me and others on my team? Um, and that led me to writing the book. Uh, so that's it in a nutshell. Excellent. And, uh, and so, I mean, nowadays we, we hear a lot, uh, people are always talking about mindset and things like this, but mm-hmm. I mean, mindset is obviously in- incredibly important. Uh, but what are some of the things that, that, really good sales leaders, what are some of the things that they do that average or not so great sales leaders don't do? When it comes to mindset and the way they think about yeah. the job? Well, I think that they are conscious of the couple of things that I said, right? How do I carry myself as a sales leader and how do I make others feel? Like, how do I treat the people on my team? But it's not only the people on my team, it's, it's our customers, it's our partners in the business externally. And so um, that was basically the question you asked me was essentially how I framed up the book mm-hmm. because I thought about it and it was easy for me to think of because I've had some, you know, growing up in sales organizations um, for 30 years, I guess, <laughs> almost now, right? Um, I've had some great leaders and some not so great leaders. And um, it was easy for me to think about how did the not so great ones operate? And that's when it hit me. I was like, it's, the, it's, it's, as I say in the book, it's pie soggle, right? It's, it's the seven deadly sins. Yeah. How do they carry themselves? How do they treat others? And evidence that the best leaders demonstrate not the seven deadly sins, but their opposing virtues. So for those of li- listening, right? I said pie soggle, an acronym, pride, envy, mm-hmm. ire, sloth, avarice, gluttony, and lust. <laughs> things that you generally don't want to reflect to people, right? Um, or know. if that describes you, maybe uh, maybe just time for some changes. Yes, yeah, or find another profession or live on an yeah. island somewhere alone, right? But, um, and, but they're opposing virtues, humility, patience, diligence, self-control, uh, goodwill, generosity, detachment, right? And we can get into a little bit of detail on some yeah. of those, but 
think about, you know, how do the best leaders, the people like I've worked for people and I work for you, John, you were a great leader, right? But Thank I've you. worked for others. <laughs> I, was wondering, I was wondering which side <laughs> I fell into. <laughs> I wanted to put you at ease for the rest of the conversation. That's why I went out of my way to say that. Um, but, you know, if you think about the leaders that I've had some, we would have run through walls for, I, you know, literally, not just figuratively, like whatever you yeah. want us to do, we will do it, right? Um, and there was definitely a difference in the way those leaders carried themselves and the way they made me feel. Uh, so, you know, to net it all out, it does boil down to applying the virtues in practice. And for every one of those virtues, you can think of very clear examples of behavior that's an indicator of self-control, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not overly indulgent. I, I control my own urges, um, you know, and that's what the book is, is mostly about, you know, from the other two books. It's, it's about stories. This isn't about Matt's principles or why Matt's good at this. This is identifying great sales leaders. And in this case, how do they demonstrate these seven great or lively virtues in the way that they do their jobs? And what impact does that have on the people around them? Yeah, and I think the thing about uh, is any, any leadership position, but particularly, obviously, in, in sales leadership, I mean, there's, it's a tough job, if, if not one of these toughest, right? It has a huge mm -hmm. turnover. And yeah. so there's a there's an there's a huge amount of stress already built into that position. So to your point, to be able to have that kind of self control, to be able to step outside of yourself, to have patience, those are I mean those are really really challenging things to do when you're when you're carrying the company number on your shoulders. Yeah, yeah, and your ability to keep those virtues in mind and demonstrate them in those really stressful times is really the key. Right. Because we're all we all have those moments. And I've had a lot of those moments myself in leadership roles where I'm, I've got, you know, like everybody else, not proud moments. Right. And uh, and, you know, having worked together, <laughs> you may have been present even for some of those. But but, you know, so, and sometimes the people that work for you or the situations you find yourself in draw you into that zone where you're like, ah, I'm going to lose it, you know, yeah. and you can't you simply can't. Yeah, we I think one of the other, yeah, we won't, yeah, we won't names. name names. <laughs> we won't name names. People who push you to that point, yeah. Right. Um, uh, so the thing about humility, which I like, is is, and I think this is where ob obviously a lot of leaders fall down, and and sales leadership too. And it's not that they come in arrogant; it's it's that they it's that they feel that they need to know better than everybody else mm -hmm. because all eyes are on them. And that's the, that's why I was plucked out of the sales team and put in the, in the leadership position. So it's not even, it's not even arrogance. It, it's almost fear of being mm -hmm. humble or, or, or admitting that you don't know things or you're there in a service or support role. Right. Look, I think a lot of the sinful behavior we see in sales organizations on the part of leaders is, it's born by insecurity, yeah. it's driven by, right? I don't feel confident enough to allow others to be the smartest ones in the room. Uh, I don't feel, you know, strong enough about my own capability to just be humble about it. You know, I've yeah. got to constantly be sort of putting that out into the, out into the market. So everybody hears it all the time. And, you know, and, and people don't consider you know, the impact of the recipient or because people see that and they know what they know where that's coming from. It's like, okay, he's, he's got to yeah. let everybody know he's the smartest guy in the room. We know what's <laughs> driving that. It's a, it's it again, it's a, it is a lack of humility, but deep down it's an insecurity and it's not a good look. It just isn't. No, no, no. It, it, it's not a good look, particularly when the people looking back at you are, you can, you, you can still see that they're going, hmm, no. Right. No, you you right. you're not you're not right this moment. You ain't the smartest person in the room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. The other thing is I like is the um, the the idea in in the virtues of of goodwill and gratitude. I mean, I think there's a huge role of gratitude, and I think it's something that yeah. we we're all guilty of falling down on is remembering. It's like that idea of catching people doing things right as opposed to catching people doing things wrong. And then the simple gratitude. And I think in, in sales, because particularly because it's so cutthroat and fast paced and everything, sure. that, that as leaders, we often forget to be grateful for yeah. what, what people are doing for us. Yeah, and we've, we've got humans working for us, right? Who wanna be appreciated and who want to be feel valued 
Goodwill, literally the word broken down, it means you will the good of the other and you mm -hmm. reflect that. Another word for it is love, we, we don't, you know, but it's, it's, it's willing the good of the other. And when somebody knows, I mean, again, it's, we don't have to dwell too long on the, on the sins here, but mm -hmm. people know when you don't will their, don't have their best interests at heart, put another way, right? Yeah. You will something else or you will your own good first long before theirs. So that's a huge part of um, getting the best out of people. There's one of the stories about goodwill I wrote about, um, you may have met him many years ago. He's at Bloomberg, a guy named Ken Napolitano. He's oh, yeah, the yeah. Chief, chief sales officer at Wheels Up right now um, okay. and has been there for a few years and is doing a tremendous job. But this is one of those people you meet and he demonstrates many of the virtues. But the one that the story is about is how does goodwill, um, what role does goodwill play when you've got an organization that's going through an integration? They acquired an organization and very different sort of culturally. How do you send a message to those new folks that they're valued? Right. And going out of his way to reflect goodwill as they still pursue important strategic initiatives, still pursue hitting the number, still pursuing creating career paths for people on his team. It, everything for him was about making sure that those people knew explicitly that he cared about what they were trying to achieve and they mattered. Uh, and that's obviously a demonstration of tremendous, like, in, you know, what's it, emotional intelligence or EQ yeah. or whatever. Yep. But, but that point, the point of, being able to recognize the fact that it's very easy for people to feel like they're a bolt on, to feel alienated, to feel like they're not part of it. So to have this, to have the smarts, not just to acknowledge it, but on a consistent basis. I mean, that's where the difference comes in. Yeah. Yeah. Look, the, everybody who takes a sales job, professional sellers know that they're ultimately going to be measured on, on numbers, on performance. And uh, I think we all take some pride in that, right? It's very much a performance-driven discipline and, and it's a tough, you know, you're going to be mentally tough to do this job. Mm -hmm. But even with that, even with the types of people that gravitate toward this role, we still want to feel like we're valued. We're more than a number, right? Yeah. We've got families, we've got things we want to achieve. We've got insecure, you know, all this stuff going on. So if you want the best out of us, um, show us that you will are good. And it's not that yeah. hard. You know? No, no, that, that's the beautiful thing about uh, what you're writing about in your book is these are all very simple concepts. And mm -hmm. and as, as we used to say back in the day with spin selling, simple concept doesn't mean that it's easy and it doesn't right. mean it's easy to implement. S these are all simple concepts, but it doesn't mean they're easy to, to implement necessarily. Uh, but I, I like one of the other ones here that you talk about is the is the liveliness or diligence or, you know, that I guess it's that. You want leaders who have an energy and people who, yeah, maybe when times are really tough, but you know that they're going to somehow find a way out of it and, and you can trust them. And I think that that's that's probably the holy grail for many sales leaders is to get to that position where people look to you and say, yeah, I know things may be tough, but I can go to them because they'll help. They'll find a solution. Yeah. 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 I think, yes, absolutely. And that's the right. Um, that's the right application of diligence in, in a sales leadership role. I think that there, you know, maybe historically, traditionally diligence meant that you were putting in more hours than anybody else. And you were the, you're the one going out there and winning the deal and making the calls for people. And in a modern sense, that's not exactly what we're talking about. Right. But it is, it's the, you know, this person is the go-to, they are going to work hard again for my good. I work for them. They're going to work their butt off and they're, they're going to be accessible and I can count on them. And, you know, they're not asking anybody to uh, work any harder than they are. They're working at different things. They're not doing my job, but they are working hard at the job of leading. And so, and so again, some great examples of uh, Julia Floor, who was uh, currently at Oracle and Ryan Ward, who's a longtime Medtronic now at iRhythm Technologies, just stories about people who just demonstrate they exude that diligence and you can see the performance of their teams lifting as a result. No, absolutely. And one thing you just touched on there is that they may be working on things, maybe working on other things, but it also comes back to that humility factor because I know you and I discussed this many times before, the worst thing the a sales leader can do is to do the old parachute in at the end, elbow the mm -hmm. salesperson aside for their own good, 
I'm just okay. elbowing you aside, Matt, for your own good, right? You, you know, you'll still get the sale, but I'm going to come and close it. And now yeah. I have, yeah, we get a deal, but we now have a, a totally demotivated, demoralized salesperson. Yeah. Yeah. And the humility, the application of humility there is that as a leader, I've got to realize that it isn't about me. You know, this is ultimately about helping others to succeed and that winning that big deal, for example, that's a perfect opportunity to put this person on a pedestal and put him or her in position to succeed. That's what the focus should be, not on whether I can do it. You already know I can do it, right? <laughs> you already know I can do it. So um, it's about them, not me. And it's funny because that whole idea of a service mentality or service leadership, a lot of people do talk about it today, but I, I feel sometimes that it, it, it strays too far into feeling a bit touchy-feely and whatever, as opposed to what we're talking about here, where you're really doing, where you're really being of service to people is, is how can I support you in this? What do you need? What can I do to clear obstacles mm -hmm. while keeping you firmly at the, you know, as the point person? Yeah, but that's that's the that's the kind of service you want. I'm just coming around going, oh, you know, rah, rah, everybody. I mean, right you now, look at that. Uh, look, I've, you know, remember and I make references to the cadence of excellence at a couple of points in this book, mm -hmm. because it, and the message there is like, let's not forget about the fact that we have to influence people's behavior and hold them accountable to their commitments and have a rhythm where we're focused on helping them work through, you know, planning and tough you know, tough things. Um, it's all of, it's all of the above, right? This isn't like then, you know, Matt's new message is be virtuous, forget about holding people accountable, forget about metrics or discipline. No, it's like, no, 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 they can coexist. You can do both. Um, in fact, that's what the best leaders do is really mm -hmm. the point of it all. Right? So. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And uh, talk to me a little bit about the detachment piece, because I think that's interesting, because sometimes when people think of detachment, they think of somebody completely removed, like who's just in their own world, doesn't care, is off on their own right. somewhere. Yeah, no, it's a good question. It's not what it means in this case. Um, and detachment is the virtue that opposes lust in my, how I've got them lined up. Not No, not carnal lust. We're talking about <laughs> lust for- Just thinking lust. this conversation was going to take an interesting turn. Yeah, anyway. yeah. Children, <laughs> turn your volume down. Um, no, it's about lust for immediate results. The lust right. for need it now, need it now, give it to me now, right? Uh, whereas detachment is, let's, yes, look, the outcome is important. And we need to get that important outcome as, as quickly as we possibly can. But I talk in that section, that chapter about, um, you know, kind of the ready, fire, aim culture. And we're just like, <laughs> everything's urgent all the time. We're always, everything, everything's urgent, yeah. right? And, and when you, if you've worked in an environment like that, you know, when everything is urgent, in fact, nothing is urgent. Yeah. And people don't pay attention anymore to what leadership asks them to do urgently. And they just, there's a lot of eye rolling going on. What, we're, what I'm encouraging people to do, and it goes hand in hand with this virtue of detachment, is let's just, we, let's apply purposeful urgency. Let's be mm. thoughtful. We want to move, you know, move quickly on the right things. As a leader, in order for me to place emphasis on my people doing, you know, just the right few behaviors that lead to, to the, the best outcomes, I can't be all over them all the time about every little part of their job, right? Instead, it's let's just be really purposeful about how we're going about this. I know it's going to take you some time to get a result because, you know, we have a six month sales cycle and I can't expect you to close every deal in 30 days, right? That's examples of what you hear mm -hmm. in these ready, fire, aim, urgent, 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 right? It's like, no, you can't, people can't do that. You're literally, you're setting an expectation that people cannot meet. So if you know it's going to take some time to meet your expectation, then detach yourself from the need for an immediate result and the need for kind of urgent action all the time and give your people the space to meet your expectations. And that's what purposeful urgency, I think, does, you know, in a, in a sales environment. Yeah, no, I like that phrase. I'm going to steal that. Uh, purposeful yeah, urgency. Just, I'm, but I'm going to say purposeful um, urgency, TM. Now yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, but but to the to that point, Matt. Though we live in this world today, where the pervasive culture is 
immediate uh, gratification it's urges everything everything should be easy now 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 all of these distractions so it actually in some ways uh, somebody who practices this kind of de detachment or we're saying purposeful urgency I mean if you're kind of going against the flow of the culture but this could be a big uh, this could be a, a huge competitive differentiator for you if you execute that well because I right. think people are I think people are fed up with being on this like hamster wheel yeah well, and I think people, people, let's be specific, are people on our teams, our customers, mm -hmm. especially, they want us to be thoughtful, you know, and unless you're in, you know, you and I've been in the sales performance business and the sales, you know, you're in sales technology, and there's so much noise made by the kind of the SaaS end of the spectrum, right, where everything's like, you know, deliver a clear message, make it simple, you know, uh, and, and that's all well and good there is still a large portion of the buying population that doesn't necessarily get value out of just that, you know, that quick and easy buy. They expect mm -hmm. us to invest and they expect our sellers or the people that represent our companies to give a damn about them and be thoughtful about our approach. And that starts, well, that starts at home, like in the sales, it starts back in the office. We need to be able to demonstrate to all of our constituents, right, that we're thoughtful, thoughtful about how we do our jobs. How the heck can I expect anybody else to be thoughtful, think critically, be patient, any of those things, if I'm not, if I'm not doing those things myself? I couldn't mm -hmm. possibly in good conscience ask them to do, to do those things. And, and the good news is that given, given the pervasive culture today is when you start to when you start to execute like that, when you start to be thoughtful, when you start to be considerate and, 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 and really value creating, I mean, you're, you're kind of standing out, which is sad to say. Right. I mean, standing out by being thoughtful is, is a sad indictment, but it's true. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I mean, look, it's worked, for, it's worked for me. It's worked for you. So yeah. as far as I'm concerned, if people want to go out into the market and not be thoughtful, I'm like, it's fine. As long as they work for a competitor, I'm good with it. You know? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. In fact, you would encourage them to go get jobs. Please do. Time. Yes, please do. <laughs> um, so this is great, Matt. What, was, what would be the one last aspect of the book that you would like to uh, tell the audience about? Sure. Well, you said it earlier, right? These are simple ideas, not easy necessarily in application. Um, you know, I use stories to make all of this relatable, to make people understand, like, oh, this is real. This is, I'm not making up these principles, some high-minded, you know, um, so the stories are important, but I think the thing that's really uh, people will find uh, most helpful is at the end of each chapter, as I have in the other books, simple device, start, stop, continue, right? If you, if I believe I read this chapter, if I believe I could be more, for example, more, um, I could exude goodwill, right? I could, I could really demonstrate that more in my environment. At the end of that chapter, it's asking me, okay, well, what are you going to start to do? What are some of the things you can incorporate in the way you lead that will demonstrate goodwill to your people? What are some of the things that you'll need to stop to cut out because you're sending the wrong message? What are some of the things you need to continue doing? Right. So by the end of this, you get through the book. You know, I think everybody has most people have opportunity to improve in all seven virtues. The main idea here is if you can just commit, if it's you know two or three, where you can make some concrete change and take action that will demonstrate more of these virtues and application in the way that you lead, it's going to make a difference in the way that you lead and it will impact, impact your people positively. So I think that start, stop, continue device is, uh, is one last thing I'd love for people to, to know about this book. Yeah, no, I think that's a great, that's a great one. And, and just to your point there is, you know, just start with one. I think that's another trap that people fall into. They go, oh, I need to improve on all of these immediately and I need to be really good at them, but it doesn't work like that. It's just choose, choose one or two and, and, and work on it uh, mindfully. Exactly. That's all mm. I'm asking you to do. Not yeah. you. Well, you too. You, you need to do <laughs> but it. Hey, yeah. hey <laughs> listen, uh, I'm, I'm, my whole life is continuous improvement. <laughs> the odd I'm step, the, the, odd, the odd one step back and a few steps forward, but you know, life, uh, that's the great thing about, uh, about this journey it's a great uh, thing about all the various businesses we've been involved in is that they're huge learning experiences for us and that's why what you're doing with your books and passing on that wisdom so hopefully people can you know can uh, maybe avoid some of the uh, 
some of the little pitfalls here and there and and they can get to success faster so it's all good the idea that's the idea john all right well listen all of matt's information will be below the video uh and links to the books uh and this one that we've been talking about today is the divine comedy of sales the sales manager's guide to virtuous leadership available from all good booksellers all right matt well listen thanks again thanks everybody for listening and i will see you all again soon